question. Um, how is is the most famous person on the planet, Tom Cruise, the face of an extreme cult like Scientology? How does that come to happen? Um, yes, he is. And that comes to happen by um, Scientology actively promoting for and trying to get celebrities on board. And they got Tom Cruise on board in the 1980s and have successfully kept him around and then reinvigorated him in the uh, early 2000s, late 1990s, so that he is a full-blown, full-blown fanatical Scientologist, first and foremost. That's and what they did, did they? I didn't know about that. They reinvigorated him. What did what happened there? Well, that was the whole uh, tuss up with Nicole uh, when they. Uh, what happened was Tom Cruise got into Scientology in the 1980s via his um, his the woman he married, Mimi Rogers. That was his first oh. wife, and she was a second gen Scientologist. Her father had been a Scientologist, and she was a highly trained Scientology auditor as well as being an actress. Oh. So they connected, had a you know wild marriage for a few years. Then on the set of Days of Thunder, Tom Cruise met Nicole Kidman, his co-star, and fell head over heels for her, decided he wanted to be with her, not with Mimi anymore, and Scientology helped facilitate that. Oh. Tom Cruise was a huge movie star by that point. He had already had you know, all of his 1980s hits under his belt, and uh, I, I think Days of Thunder was early 90s. Wow. And um, and so they helped him get Nicole, uh, and he had that marriage through the 1990s. But one of the problems with that marriage is that Nicole Kidman's father is a practicing psychologist. Oh, and Scientology, <laughs> yeah, Scientology hates psychiatry and psychology, um, like badly. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it looks like we're, it looks like this is all working here. So, um, then he started kind of distancing a little bit from Scientology. This is by mid nineties. We're talking about, he was maybe not doing so much Scientology, sort of maybe talking about it a little bit here and there, read a book, stuff like that, but no couch jumping, no wild, you know, assertions about it. No, like in your face proselytizing of it he was kind of cool on it and nicole i think was kind of you know nicole kidman's influence i think was part of that she started doing scientology and got up you know up to the confidential levels but she was never really totally on board with it the same way he had been so their marriage you know ups and downs whatever Tom Cruise's life, he starts getting talked to a little bit more about Scientology. This guy, Marty Rathbun, who's now out, long time out, was uh, basically became Tom Cruise's handler. He was kind of put on the case to get Tom Cruise back on board, like fully and completely and really rejuvenate him in Scientology. That's what David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, that's what he wanted. He wanted Tom Cruise back on board fully. And in order to do that, Marty um, engaged in what we'll call a little bit of parental alienation, where he decided to turn the kids against Nicole and go for Tom and pro-Scientology, Scientology, Scientology. And Nicole and, uh, you know, that didn't respond well to that, I suppose, because they ended up separating and uh, divorcing. And that's how that kind of happened is it was Scientology's influence because they were trying to get him fully back on board and they succeeded. I'm not sure exactly what they did. I know some of what they did, but it, and it's, you know, it's kind of Scientology related stuff, but they basically convinced Tom that Nicole and Nicole's father and that connection and that whole situation was a troublesome, problematic thing for him to have in his life. And it was a bad, negative influence on his kids, their adopted children. And I convinced him well enough that they ended up separating and divorcing. And, uh, wow. and then, of course, Scientology then, with, with Cruz fully back on board, and David Miscavige really integrated into Tom Cruise's life now as his best friend, best bud. They were bros. 
now they start talking, Tom and David Miscavige, about what they're going to do about Scientology and let's grow Scientology. It's like Scientology really, really big and, and the thing to do. And Tom decided in the early 2000s that he would be the big media you know, spokesperson, celebrity personality, really do his job, do his part as a Scientologist and as the most famous celebrity in the world. And that's why we saw all the antics that he engaged in in the, in the early, mid-2000s. Oh, my word. So it's, it's... the summary of the, of, the, of the history there. So I know I know a lot of people are obviously familiar with Scientology and even more are obviously familiar with Tom Cruise and his involvement in it. But I think, I, I don't know, I might be wrong about this, but I think just what you've said, which should be common knowledge, I think you might have blown a few minds there. Because I think, firstly, I don't think many people know about Tom Cruise's first wife at all, let alone mm-hmm. that she was who got him into Scientology. Um, and secondly, I don't. I, I, while people know so that he's that he's big in Scientology, I don't think people are fully aware of quite what a role he's played in in keeping it alive and propelling the whole thing. This is a huge cult. So let's go back to. I mean, what can you tell me about? Uh, was it Mimi Rogers? You said. Mm-hmm. That's right. Hmm. What yeah, can you tell she, me about her? Well, she's you know she's obviously was an actress. She was a bit bigger in the eighties than she has been since. But she um, she was she was an auditor. She's a trained auditor, and what that means is is uh, it's a uh, Scientology version of a counselor, right, or a therapist. It's really not therapy, and, and I take great pains to try to say it's not. But it kind of looks like it, you know. And she was trained in that. And again, second generation. She'd been raised, as I understand it, she was raised in Scientology or or had had influence with that uh, through her, most of her life. So Tom had a problem with, um, as I understand it, the the hook, the thing that kind of got him to start paying attention to Scientology and what it could do for him is he was suffering from dyslexia. He had he had reading issues and study issues, and he had a real hard time with that. And by um, the study methodology that Scientology promotes includes spending an awful lot of time in dictionaries clearing up words, understanding words, the symbols, the ideas that are being communicated. And he really got into that, like seriously, really got into backing that up. And apparently it helped him in some fashion, enough that he promoted it publicly and actually even went and spoke at the grand opening of a Scientology uh, educational facility called Applied Scholastics. And he was really gung-ho and really on board with this. And, you know, good for him. I'm pretty sure he had, you know, good intent when it comes to spreading, you know, how to how to handle learning disabilities or study right. issues or problems. And if he gained from that, then then great. Um, but then he dumped Mimi. <laughs> right? And then it's like, oh, yeah, but I don't, you know, and once Nicole came along, it was like, oh, you know, starry eyed and. And it was, it, as I understand it, it was pretty unceremonious. I mean, it was just, okay, well, this is what I want and this is what I'm going to do. And, and, uh, and if we look at Mimi, Nicole, Katie, we see Tom as somebody, it, it, I don't know that it's, you know, such a stretch to say that this is a guy who likes new things, <laughs> novelty. He likes adventure and excitement and, and things always mixed up. And what's the next big mountain to climb? What's the next big goal to attain? And that's kind of his thing. And I guess it applies to his relationships as well because he's had a bit of a hard time maintaining long-term relationships. Mimi Rogers must feel a bit pissed off, really, because she got him in. She must be like, I got you into this whole thing and now I'm being replaced. Has she ever spoken out about that? any of this? Not that I'm aware of. And not only would there be... Um, you know, non-disclosure agreements up one side and down the other with that. But also she, as far as I, I, I don't know if she's even left Scientology or, or has a problem with Scientology. And if, if she is still connected with the mother church through family connections, business associates, whatever, or she's still a believer, which is possible. I, I, I've never heard that she has officially left Scientology. Mm-hmm. That itself would be a pressure point on her to not say a word. doesn't matter how you feel about it. You're not saying anything publicly about this. Tom is the star. You are not. Keep your damn mouth shut would be the attitude of the church towards her about that issue. So, you know, that nothing, nothing 
can threaten Tom Cruise's public image or um, status in Scientology. He is he is absolutely top rank as far as the celebrity Scientologists go. And basically, David Miscavige stood on a stage, I think it was in 2004, and presented Tom Cruise with the uh, highest award that you can receive in Scientology, the Freedom Medal of Valor. That's that video everybody has seen. And um, that was not something David Miscavige has ever done before or since. Hmm. It was kind of a big deal you know, for Tom Cruise to receive that. And he called Tom Cruise the most dedicated Scientologist he knows. Pretty big slap in the face to all the people who actually are working (laughs) 24-7, given that Tom Cruise, you know, goes on a microphone every now and again and says some nice words or jumps on a couch or something. I mean, it's not really working his guts out for Scientology the same way I used to, and, and many other, you know, thousands of other people who, who have worked in Scientology's C organization, they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're really hardcore cult center that, you know, that was a slap in the face to all of those people. But David Miscavige had no problem doing that because Tom Cruise has to be exalted and raised on a pillar, you know, in front of all the other Scientologists. And that um. feeds, and, and the point on that that shouldn't be ignored is, not only does that um, disseminate or proselytize Scientology, but it also elevates Tom Cruise's ego for Tom Cruise. You know, look at how great you are. Look at how wonderful you are. The leader of of your religion thinks you're the most dedicated person in it. Wow. Mm. You know, so it's all about that ego love bombing, ego boosting thing that we talk about with cults. You know, this is Tom Cruise's is far from uh, immune to such things. <laughs> you know? Man. If if uh, anyone, if you've just joined us, I'm here with Chris Shelton. Go check out his channel. If you're coming from his channel, please go check out my channel as well. Um, and and we are talking Scientology and Tom Cruise. We'll get onto Chris's own uh, experience in, it, in in a little bit. So on onto your point. Oh, and also by the way, a few people were commenting saying there haven't been many likes on this video. So hit the like button, whether you're on Chris's or my uh, channel. Please hit like and all those YouTubey things that I don't really know that much about. We'd uh, really appreciate it. It will help spread the video loads and say hi and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> so does that, in Scientology, does that cause a little bit of um, annoyance or, or resentment about Tom Cruise? Because as you say, there's people in the Sea Org. I gather there are people who are, you know, washing the floors and things, working 20 hours a day, not sleeping. And then Tom Cruise goes and speaks in a talk show and that's and he's the best ever Scientologist. Is Do you know of any resentment within Yes, I do, because I certainly resented him when I was in. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But it's a a subtle sort of thing. You can only get away with saying, you know, or expressing so much about this. Right. There's no way you can get away with running around in the world of Scientology calling Tom Cruise a dick. Right. Or or saying he's (laughs) taking advantage or, you know, God, that guy, you know, or and you certainly you. and, And if that if you can't do that. You definitely cannot badmouth David Miscavige for what he said or for, you know, any of him pushing Tom Cruise on us. But we did. It was definitely that was absolutely resentment about really? that. There was there yeah. was a it was a weird sort of thing because when I was a Sea Org member, and this and again, the Sea Org is the 24-7 billion year contract. You're dedicated, you're not doing anything with your life but Scientology. You don't have a job. You don't go to work. Scientology is all you're doing. So as a Sea Org member, right, we were hardcore dedicated. Um, You don't, you you didn't get to openly criticize or be skeptical or critical of Tom Cruise or David Miscavige in any way. So what you have to get away with are you know, wide eyes and that kind of look you get when you're kind of talking to somebody where you're both commiserating, but not, you can't really say anything. You just kind of, oh yeah, Tom Cruise. Yeah. Mm." You know, that, that, that's, that is dangerous. Just saying that much about him would be a dangerous thing to do. I mean, there was a story Mark Headley told, which is worth repeating here that Tom Cruise is himself a pretty vindictive guy. And, 
there's this story that he tells is that uh, around that same time period, around that same 2003, 2004 time, Cruz pulled in, uh, had a meeting uh, in Hollywood with uh, the other Scientology celebrities. Uh, you know, here we're talking about Jenna Elfman at that time, uh, uh, um, maybe Kate Ma, or uh, sorry, I'm forgetting her name. Um, Michael Pena, Elizabeth Moss, you know, these, oh. the people who are Scientologists who are celebrities. Sure. Travolta? Uh, Travolta may or may not have been at this particular meeting. Okay. Um, he says to them, I'm sick and tired of the fact that you people aren't doing your part to pull your freight in with Scientology. You know, I'm doing all this stuff. You guys aren't saying anything about it. You barely talk about it. You do the bare minimum. Enough's enough. This is bullshit. Times are going to change. And you guys are going to get out there and you're going to promote Scientology and talk Scientology and do Scientology. You're going to get active. And if you don't, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to do something about it to you personally, right? I'm going to, I'm going to impinge on your career. I'm going to ruin you. This is what I understand that occurred at this meeting. Right. And this wow. is, uh, this is the story that Mark tells. And it's, uh, it, you know, it's an intense story, but when you, when you put together the anecdotes that you hear over the years about Tom Cruise before Scientology and after, what I see here is that we have somebody who um, struggled very hard, you know, did it, paid his dues, did his work, you know, got got big, got into the industry, had his lucky breaks, got into the right places at the right time to get on, to get noticed by the right people so that he w in risky business is where things really took off for him. Um, that's all fine. Very self-centered, very egotistical, very like, you know, very energetic about his work, though, very interested in doing the job. And um, Scientology came along and kind of ramped up every awful thing that was there in his personality to be ramped up. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, because it's like yeah. Scientology is an ego fest. And I can tell you from personal experience, I mean, I was involved with it for 27 years. It's it's all about feeding ego. That's what keeps you going in Scientology is, is the fact that you know you are somebody important just for being a Scientologist. Now, Tom Cruise is already somebody important. Yeah. Then you amp into this, you, you feed into this, you know, Hollywood-centric, actor-centric ego, a spiritual importance a a, a a a a you are saving the world through what you're doing kind of ego feeding and you know and it blows up to exponential proportions it's it's ridiculous it, it it's mind-blowing how how big the guy's mm -hmm. ego is and um but that's how it is that's where it's that's where it's at that's what scientology's kind of done to him it's really weird, um, and I guess it's a sign of the changing times. But you know, whenever you watch, and I, I might have said this to you when we last spoke as well, when you watch uh, some of those Tom Cruise movies from back at the early '90s, or even now, actually, uh, I'm talking about A Few Good Men or Risky Business, as you say, The Color of Money, uh, the one with Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man. Rain Man He's yeah. outrageously arrogant uh, to 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 the point of being um, very unlikable. I, I I think extremely unlikable, uh, and I was p particularly watching it um, if you're watching it with a woman because you know he's utterly sexist. The women don't get any lines at all. He's and and I'm not I, I'm not some woke guy or anything like that at all. Um, but the Tom Cruise in particular, his characters are horrible, um, and so I can see what you mean. It seems like they're an extension of him, and and then the Scientology stuff. Oh, it's just too much, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. A lot of his roles and, and the ones that he tends to gravitate toward, especially, you know, in the last 20 years, have been all about um, story arcs where you have this, you know, very egocentric character, very, you know, arrogant, uh, whatever. And he has to somehow go through a hero's journey, take a fall, learn his lesson and then come back stronger than ever and beat all the bad guys and kill everybody and do everything he's supposed to do and come out the hero. And the, and, and, the, and the weird thing that I've always noticed about his movies is how all the other supporting characters always know what an amazing superhero, godlike character he is. 
and they facilitate him through his fall, you know, help him out, pick him back up, and then, you know, start worshiping him again. Like there's this kind of, you have to be following him. You can't just like him or be his friend in his movies. You have to kind of worship him or something. It's, it's, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but that's what I see when I look at his movies for the most part is, is, is his insistence that he be this nearly infallible character. And even his character flaws or his downfalls are really never his fault not really, you know, that big of a problem, and he doesn't really have to suffer that much. And then he comes right back and saves mm-hmm. the day and everything. And it's all about his heroism and him saving the day. And it's kind of along the same flavor, I guess you could connect the dots to the kind of actors who do their own stunts and, you know, like, oh, I do all my own stunts. And it's like, you know, that's not really your job. <laughs> Taking There's the job from someone else. Well, you are. I mean, serious. Yeah. It, it's kind of like, you know, is there some, if there was some kind of ego boost or if there was some kind of fame to be gotten in saying, well, I'm my own sound guy. I record all my own sound, right? Then yeah. he would do it, <laughs> right? If he was, yeah. Yeah. There was I'm, I'm my own cameraman. If I was, you know, if there was some other job he could steal, but for some reason, the stunt thing is the one that, you know, that he gravitates toward because it's so dangerous and will get him more uh attention and likes and admiration and that kind of thing and yeah well, if there's one it's, it's, Tom Cruise loves, it's admiration well yeah and not just in his movies um if you see some of the interviews when you know he, he gets admired everywhere he goes of course but on the very rare occasions when an interviewer shows a bit of a cheeky side or a bit of a not not venerating tom cruise he really loses his mind and there was that of the two famous ones i know of are, are um matt lauer that was about psychiatry and then there was peter overton i think uh, he's australian i, I imagine it. you've seen both of those right that's right Yes, uh, the the Overton one was. Uh, both of them were quite in, quite I- I- insightful. They 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 were they were revealing because the real Tom Cruise popped out for a minute. Yeah, and and see that's the thing is 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 is, is it's hard to you know you me other people you get on camera you kind of try to put your best foot forward. You try to put your best face on. You you know, you want to come off well. You don't want to come off looking like an idiot. Tom Cruise takes that to to a, to a, a astronomical level, right? He's so controlled when he's on camera. And everything about his public appearances is very, very controlled. And that's that word control. There's a lot, Cruise control, you know, there's a lot there. <laughs> to be looked into right cruise is very 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 control oriented so when things happen that he didn't predict for or aren't under his control see he's great when everything is under his control he's wonderful he's he's, you know actors other people talk about him in glowing terms he's so wonderful he's so professional he's so on it and i'm sure all those things are true from their experience of him Yet, what does it take to put things in that level of control? How many people does he have working for him behind the scenes? And what does he have to do to get them to control things to this degree? Well, these are Scientologists who are mostly working for him. And they're willing to do anything he says. And they have to call him sir and things like that, right? So you get this sort of, then you start seeing that there's this curtain. And now the other side of the curtain is human trafficking, and his and his and his weird stuff is like, wait a minute, what? These guys are doing what for you? And they're and they're and they're working for free and they're and they're what? They're spying for you and they're doing this for you and that and they're spying on you. I mean, like that there's weird stuff between him and his relationship with the church. Man. Where he has these handlers, right? And they help him and facilitate his life, but at the same time they report on everything he does to back to David Miscavige. Oh, it's so weird. It's so it's weird. Very- it's, oh. it's a very convoluted kind of life, and that's why he's so tense and on all the time. Is he's all he's trying to micromanage all these elements in his yeah. life, and 
when he fails to do that, you get a Matt Lauer interview. You get a, you know, the other... Um, uh, uh, over, of- Peter Overton. Well, the Peter Overton, the interesting thing is because you said he's quite a vindictive guy, Tom Cruise. And the questions that, that really seem to annoy Tom Cruise were ones that he, as Peter Overton says, you've answered these questions before to other press, so what's the problem here? But right at the beginning of the conversation, Peter Overton says to him, I didn't know I was going to have to do a four-hour Scientology, uh, like going around sci- a tour to be able to speak to you and Tom Cruise just says well you didn't have to and he says well you know yes obviously I did if I was going to speak to you and it felt I wonder if what was happening later on he was just saying like are you still friendly with Nicole which is a very reasonable question for an Australian presenter to ask I'd want to know if I were Australian because that's our our actress is from there Um, so is that what was happening he was just angry from the beginning maybe about that comment about oh I didn't know I'd have to go to Scientology and he's taking it out on Peter Overton for the rest of the interview oh that's yeah that's not a hard inference to draw at all right because Mm -hmm. again there's a little exposure there of the kind of control exactly what I'm talking about Behind the scenes, there's a control point, right? You're not going to interview me unless you go find out all about Scientology first. But they're not making that. That's not a transparent point of the interview. Tom Cruise did not expect him to say that on camera. No. Because he didn't want that known. And then, no. he, then he tries to tell him, oh, well, you didn't have to do that. But as you mentioned, of course he did. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking. That's the kind of control he puts there. It's above and beyond. It's like when he sets up a Scientology booth on the set of War of the Worlds. Why would you? Who does that? Why would you do that? That's crazy. But that's what he insists on doing is he wants it. Then that makes it normal. That makes it okay. And we're going to do it this way. And if you question it, how dare you? How dare you? Get your manners in. I think that's what he told the guy, right? Get your manners yes. in. Yes. And, and then, but at the end, at the end, he's 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 sort no. of okay with him. At the end, he's he's sort of because because uh, Overton says, "Oh, you know, that was a bit awkward, wasn't it?" That's my Australian mm-hmm. accent; it's terrible. But uh, uh, and Tom Cruise says, "Like, like you, you went out of line, and I I brought you back." Okay, you went out of line. I brought you back in. It's okay, nah. uh, like that. Really, like this control thing. Really odd. But you know, you talk about War of the Worlds. That was um, uh, Steven Spielberg. Why are these people like Spielberg, like so many other huge names who could have any actor they ever wanted? What, you know, and, and we're in a world right now where you say one word out of line, and you, you know, you could be cancelled, you or not picked. Which is fine. That's a director's prerogative, you know. And yet they're all choosing to. You, you talk about human. I'm, I'm going to use a transporting because I've heard the other word can can get you picked up on YouTube. Probably just nonsense, but I've heard that. But human human transporting and um, all sorts of abuses going on. Why is it overlooked when it's Tom Cruise? Because he draws in millions and billions of dollars. Obviously, <laughs> you know. There's there's there, it, people it, people can. It's so funny. I mean, when it comes to Hollywood, th- there is no morality. There is no moral code. I, you know, people seem to think that, that that Hollywood and there's all these liberals there and they push all these extreme liberal <laughs> values. And it's like, it, it's not, it, you know, yes, there are actors who have liberal progressive ideas and values and would like to see them reflected in entertainment. But that's not who makes the decisions about what gets seen on the screen. The things that get thrown up on the screen are the things that are that, that, that the executives believe are going to make money. And Tom Cruise is one of the biggest money-making individuals in Hollywood for decades, decades. Yeah. This guy's name will draw millions and millions and millions of viewers. So if you as a director, right, like you're a Steven Spielberg and you want to produce a movie, now automatically as a Steven Spielberg, your movie's going to get seen. You're not going to have a problem getting your movie made and you're not going to have a problem getting your movie seen. But if you want to have the maximum number of eyeballs on it, you're going to want a Tom Cruise in your movie. You're going to want yeah. a Tom Hanks in your movie. You know, you're going to want somebody with 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 power. And of course, there is a work ethic. There is a professionalism that they bring. And apparently, this is, has been said so many times, I have to believe it's true, that Tom Cruise really does bring his A game when he shows up on set. He is yeah. focused. He's there. He's doing his job. He's very good. Yeah. And he's and he's good at what he does. I don't happen to um, to think that acting-wise, his, his acting chops are really that amazing. I don't think they are. But... Mm. Um, but they are um, 
they're good for what he's doing, for the genre that he's in. For action movies, he does great. And he comes up with, you know, very imaginative visual effects and 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 stunts and things like that that he likes to get involved in. And and again, I'm sure that same level of control is being brought to all of that as is being brought to his PR game. Yeah. So, you know, so it's so it's kind of a, you know, in terms of the industry people fall all over themselves to work with Tom Cruise. He is, he is the power player, one of the top power players in Hollywood to this day. And it's understandable if you're a John Hamm, you know, and you get offered a role in Tom, in, uh, in Top Gun 2. Hmm. He, he told uh, Howard Stern in an interview, John Hamm was going on about this. He said uh, he got offered the role and he was like, it was no, no brainer. Of, it, of course I'm doing it. You know, his agent calls him and is like, hey, you want to do this? He goes, yeah, of course I'm doing it. Well, we're negotiating the money. No, you're not. I'm doing that movie. I don't care. <laughs> Just make it work. If you don't get me this movie, you're fired and everybody else is fired. Get me in that movie. <laughs> that was his attitude about it. Just sight unseen, not knowing anything about it except it's Top Gun 2 and Tom Cruise is in it. There are, there are cases, I guess, where people do... But again, I feel like it's only because they know the bad press will outweigh when they choose not to work with someone. It's not really because they've got their own scruples because humans don't work that way. And it's only because they know that the press will be bad. And I think, for example, Woody Allen's an example where a lot of people now say I won't work with him. And, you know, again, understandably so. Uh, But I, I wonder... I wonder had Tom Cruise, you know, we don't know, I suppose it's a totally different set of uh, events that, you know, why with Woody Allen and why that's controversial. But Tom Cruise is just such a big name. And Woody oh. Allen was more art house. So. Well, very much so. I mean, Woody Allen has a whole different kind of fame connected with him. The, mm. Here's the thing about Tom Cruise is um, maybe this is unfair. I don't think it is, but I know some people might, might think it is. Um, you know, people knew what Harvey Weinstein was all about for years. Yeah. And yet they fell all over themselves to work with him or for him as a producer because they knew his his movies got seen. He would produce movies and they would get seen. And if you wanted to be a person in a movie that was going to get seen, you dealt with that. Now, I'm not saying it's right. It's not right. It's not right at all that people had to do what Harvey Weinstein wanted them to do in order to get their movies seen. But... That was the price. I don't imagine it's a whole lot different with Tom Cruise. And one of the things that's clear in working with Tom Cruise is you have to be glowing about him (laughs) when you're asked about him. Because I mean, every single actor who's ever worked with the guy, right? Or not every single one. uh, I can cite Brad Pitt, for example, as somebody who said he'll never work with him again. Did he? Yeah, he did. What did he say? I said something subtle. I can't remember the exact words. I read it recently, but it was um, just there were people on a list he has of people he's not going to work with. And Tom Cruise was reportedly on that list after he did interview with the vampire with him. He just did not get along with him and did not think that that was somebody he wanted to work with again. I guess. Yeah, they they kind of butted heads (laughs) or whatever. It was it was okay. Uh, so, um, so not everybody is, is super happy with Tom Cruise, right? I mean, Leah's got things to say about him. She certainly interacted with him behind the scenes, even Mm. if she never worked with him on a set. What she said, that's Leah, uh, Remini or Remini, Remini, who was also a a Scientologist. What what does she say about Tom Cruise? Well, she says quite a bit about him because she was at his wedding, right? And it was in Rome with Katie Holmes. Uh I think. And I think that was in 2006, I think they got married. Um, anyway, she she had a problem. Her big problem was, where's where's Shelly? Where's David Miscavige's wife here? How come she's not here? David Miscavige was Tom Cruise's oh, yeah. best man at the wedding, but David Miscavige's wife doesn't show up to the wedding? What's up with that? Well, turns out she hasn't been seen in public ever since then. Uh, we haven't seen Shelly Miscavige in over 15 years. Uh, in public, people wonder if she's even still alive. Wow, that's really scary. Yeah, seriously, right? And and Tom Cruise's wedding was the was the sort of jump off point, was the sort of uh, um, impetus for Leah Remini to actually get out of Scientology and take her entire family with her. Was she started asking questions about things that happened there? And that led to a domino series of events, which led to her getting the hell out of Scientology. Wow. And exposing I've got her 
Yes. I've got her friend or, or her colleague, Mike Rinder, coming on um, next week, actually, to talk, Great. talk about some new book. Yeah. He's, yeah, he'll tell you all about that. Oh, really good. So, yeah. So Tom's, you know, so so it's really, I don't know that it's super complicated, the situation with him. And um, I got to thinking about this after our last conversation about him, you know, where I kind of called him a monster and said he was just really horrible person. And he's done very horrible things. But I, I you know, I'm, I don't mean to, I'm not going to walk that back because, you know, doing monstrous things means that that's what you are. And he's done some monstrous things to people uh, in the name of uh, Scientology and his own and his own personal, you know, scene, situation. Um, but I also get why it is that he's like he's never going to leave Scientology. He's never going to get out of that headspace. And it's because he is so successful. He doesn't after he doesn't have to suffer any of the consequences for his bad behavior. Yeah. That's what it is. No, He's, that's what it is. Right? I, I don't want you to walk back the monster things because I used I used that quite heavily in the public <laughs> publicizing <laughs> publication of it. Oh, Tom Cruise is a monster. It's quite eye opening, but it sounds like it's true. Um, I want to get on to um, and, and of course, look. Uh, here's here's the thing. Nobody is all bad. Nobody is all good, and we are all products of our environment to an extent as well. And you know, when when you get put on a pedestal, I'd like to see how I react. And also the people I was having a go at before, you know, why do they work with him and that kind of thing. What you just said, I I probably, and maybe it's controversial to say, if I were an actor, you know, up, up and coming actor, and I had the chance back in the day to work with uh, Harvey Weinstein, if I had the chance to work with Tom Cruise, and I knew the press didn't necessarily know all these things, and I could get away with it, I'd probably do it. And I'd be sitting there in my mansion 10 years later, going, well, I made a decision, it might have been immoral, but... You know, or sitting ten years later in a basement somewhere, that, like a you know dwelling just about surviving, going well. I've got my uh, I've got my morals, don't I? But nothing else. So it's a difficult exactly. choice. What about um, Katie Holmes? Um, so h- how did that come about that they met and everything, and how did it fall apart? Yeah. So okay, here's what I can tell you directly about this: is that in the uh, around that same time as that Freedom Medal of Valor and that time period, because I was still banging around in the Sea Org during that time, there was an international effort within the world of Scientology to find the most beautiful Scientologists. Now, we were told that this was for a modeling thing or a film thing for some internal purpose. It had nothing to do with Tom Ah. Cruise. But people were tasked with doing this, people who worked for uh, the, the Golden Era Productions Division of Scientology, the part that makes the films and videos and everything, they were scouring all the models and, and face, you know, headshots and everything of all the celebrities and all the people who want to be celebrities or models who are in Scientology. And I don't imagine this is a huge list of people, but, um, but there are some beautiful people in Scientology. I was not on that project. I knew the person who was on that project in the West US where I was working at the time. And it was just kind of this, you know, drop everything, get this done. And they were working on it for, I think, a couple of weeks. We'd never really heard much from them. They weren't, you know, the gold person. Uh, his name was Andrash. He didn't attend any meetings. We didn't see him for his, he, you know, he just didn't surface for about two weeks. And it's because he was working on this project. And I had no idea what it was until years later when I left and the timing and everything. I'm like, holy cow, that was the Katie project. Because what that was, was they were looking for another Nicole. Like, okay, he's dumped Nicole. He's, that's gone. Uh, he's got his kids. He's, you know, he's moving forward, but he really likes having a woman. Let's get him a woman. Let's find him a Scientologist this time. Strategically, from the Church of Scientology's point of view, it makes complete sense that they would try to set him up with somebody who was already a hardcore, full-blown Scientologist. Given, this is conjecture on my part, but given the fact that, you know, he micromanages his life to such a degree, it's hard for me, it stretches my credulity to think that he didn't know that this was happening. Mm. I mean, you know, it just seems to me a stretch. Um. David Miscavige clearly the driving force behind this thing because the, the, the orders were top, top, top priority. I mean, when it's a drop everything and you're not seeing people for weeks, 
you know this is not just a regular ordinary kind of project this is a this is what was called a department 21 project david miscavige is referred to internally as department 21 <laughs> <laughs> right Optimism for you know top of the top of the food chain right okay. um so this project happens and somehow either that resulted that that didn't result in a a full-blown scientologist for whatever reason that didn't work out now there were candidates who were tried there was a scientology actress um, I'm going to butcher her name, so let me see if I can look it sure. up really fast. While, while you're looking it up, I'll just say thank you, everyone, for coming again. And if you just joined, if you're on the live stream, um, I'm Andrew Gold, for obviously, from the on not obviously because I'm so cool or anything, but you know because of the, the name in front of me that says On the Edge with Andrew Gold. And I'm interviewing Chris Shelton, a former Scientologist, about uh, Tom Cruise and Scientology. We might have to do this like a, a, a second one, because I think initially we were going to do Tom Cruise halfway through and then move on to coercion in general and cults and stuff we might have to do a second one in a couple of weeks because the tom cruise stuff is there's so much to talk about loads of people here if you're here please do hit the like button and introduce yourself in the chat i think that will spread this out to more more people and everything and if you're watching on chris's come subscribe and on the edge with andrew gold lots of cult stuff and all that and if you're watching on mine definitely go and subscribe to chris's amazing channel all about scientology and again cult and coercion quite similar channels go on chris have you found have you found what you were looking for yeah yeah her name is um uh nazanin boniandi boniadi okay and uh she's an iranian actress uh british actress and activist born in iran raised in london she was a scientologist she's no longer one and the reason why is because of tom cruise because she was set up with him she seemed to be she, – she, she tells the whole story. You can look this up, and I'm not going to repeat all of it here because I don't remember every detail. But basically, she got set up with Tom Cruise. They started going out. She expressed some things that like, she had a headache one time when he wanted to go do something, and, and that pissed him off that she didn't want to go because she had this headache. And then before she knew it, she was in his, in his life, and then boom, she was out of his life. Sent to Clearwater, Florida. She was sent down to Flag in Clearwater and made to scrub toilets with a toothbrush and made to do what? other. Oh, yeah. Very degrading physical work uh, as a result of this falling out with Tom Cruise. She had an upset Tom. And there is no higher crime, apparently, in Scientology than upsetting Tom. <sighs> so she was uh, run through the, the grist mill because of that. And she and this is her. She she's laid all this out. Wow, I'm not making this stuff up. And um, and that's one of the things that made her realize, holy cow, what am I actually involved in here? This is awful. And she, you know, hit the eject button uh, not too long after. So that was one of the outcomes of this attempt to set him up with a Scientologist, right? This, and she's drop dead gorgeous. She's absolutely, you know, beautiful woman. Um, but it didn't work out. Then somehow, some way, Katie Holmes got into the orbit and she's not, she was not a Scientologist, but somehow that happened. And, uh, in, in a whirlwind romance, I mean, it was like in a couple months, they went from dating to marriage proposal and, um, and then she got pregnant, I think before the wedding and then they got married and, uh, and they were together, I think, six years, and they had Suri, uh, their daughter. Well, I think it was 2012, um, Katie Holmes had to arrange, and this really doesn't get as much attention. I, I, it got a lot of attention when it happened, and then it just kind of moved on. The celebrity media is, is, is kind of hmm. very stuck in what's happening right now, 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 now. Yeah. He but was jumping a, on the sofa, wasn't he? Oprah, so, this was sofa time, jumping like a madman right. on the sofa. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That was that time period. He was proclaiming her his love for her. She was proclaiming her love for him. It was this big whirlwind tomcat thing in the in the media. Everybody was going gaga about it. Um, they get married, you know. Again, have Surrey. Then, you know, six years later, she arranges to escape from him. She didn't just divorce him or say, "Hey, I'm I'm kind of done." She had to actually escape. She her father fortunately for her, is a divorce attorney, pretty high-powered divorce attorney in New York. 
And she arranged things. She fired the staff that were assigned to her by Tom, bodyguard, advisor, handler, whatever. She got those people out. She was being, by the way, from the very beginning, she was being trailed by a Scientologist handler who was with her all the time. Every time she was on camera, in public, whatever, this Scientologist was trailing her with her. Um, Anyway, she escaped from all of that, got all those people out of her life, and within, I think, about a week or two, had um, arranged burner phones, and you know, a part, uh, she got this apartment, and she got away. She escaped, and she called him while she waited until he was out of town up in uh, Iceland doing a film shoot, and she then called him and said, we're done, uh, and, and apparently it blindsided him probably shouldn't have. There were indications that they had been growing apart before then. Um, but she took off and she uh, and she got out of his orbit. And it was quick. Like within a couple of weeks, the divorce was finalized. Her father was like all over that. And mm -hmm. I think as long as she didn't have anything to say about it, which she did not, she has not really spoken publicly about it in any real significant way ever since. And this is going on 10 years ago now. Um, as long as she keeps her mouth shut, Tom's going to be okay with her and she still gets a career and she still gets a life and he doesn't, you know, try to fair game her and the church of Scientology doesn't try to fair game her, meaning right. they squawk, harass, try to ruin you utterly. That's, that's their, that's the name for the policy. They, they apply when they do that and they do do it and they are pretty hardcore about it. But somehow she got out of that probably because she does have Tom Cruise's kid. And she mm -hmm. has she has rights to to she has she uh, is the parent. Tom just has visitation rights, which I guess he hardly ever uses. Is that uh, right? Yeah, he hardly ever sees his daughter. I don't. In fact, I can't remember the last time he saw her. At least that it was reported on. Um, it might, might be in secret. You know? Yeah, it, they might be. They might be. But um, you know, public indications are that he has has not really been very interested in the in the life of his daughter and because one of the reasons that it is put out there and i think this is something tom himself admitted to and i and i, I hope i'm right about that i, I read it I read it this I reviewed it this morning is one of the reasons that she left was that she didn't want surrey to get involved with scientology and she was coming of an age where that was going to start happening about six or seven years old is when you can really start going in on a kid with Scientology. Up until then, that doesn't really, it's not going to be very meaningful. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want that. And she had been having Scientology forced on her. And she was like, yeah, this isn't this ain't my thing. And like Nicole, she was like, yeah, this, this, this isn't my thing. And so, you know, she got out of there and she saved her, her daughter. Was it, was and, there a big, a, a bit of tension? I just, just, I was just going to ask about the the, the pregnancy and the uh, the, the painkillers. Oh, was that a source yeah. source of contention? Yeah, yeah, that was a source of contention as well. Dianetics, uh, one of L. Ron Hubbard's brainchilds is that you are supposed to be absolutely quiet around an injured person because any words you say go directly into the subconscious part of the mind that will then use those words later to traumatize you or cause you to do things you don't want to do. That's the basic theory, uh, one of the basic theories of Dianetics. It's total pseudoscientific nonsense. There's really no evidence of that. But, you know, uh, Hubbard went all in on that belief, and Scientologists therefore believe that, uh, you know, pain, injury, unconsciousness, you got to be quiet. And it's not necessarily, by the way, a bad thing to be quiet around unconscious people. I'm not suggesting that there's something harmful about it, but it's but to be so insistent, to be so obsessive about it, and to the point where birth as a process tends to be a bit noisy and awful. And in Scientology, they want quiet, silent births. They don't want anybody saying anything uh, that might get into the mother or child's you know, subconscious mind. They call it the reactive mind in Scientology. And uh, and so they try to guard against that. And that was another bone of contention, apparently, is, you know, oh, now we have to go through this whole ordeal as though having a baby isn't bad enough. Now I got to have all this pseudoscience added on top of it, which uh, is just useless nonsense. But that's, you know, 
that's Tom Cruise for you. Man, I cut you off before when you were still you were still talking about Katie Holmes. Do you remember what you were you were saying then? I think we were getting up to like the point oh, when she had to escape. To say, yeah, all I wanted to say there real fast was um, that it really that that she does need, it, it, regardless of any of the specifics of awfulness or traumatizing behavior that might have occurred from Tom to Katie. I really want to validate Katie for rescuing her daughter from Scientology because that is what she did. It's, it is something to be rescued from. I grew up in Scientology. I grew up with it, and I know what it does to you, and it does bad things. It's, it's, not, it's not just another set of beliefs. It's a set of practices and techniques that you use on yourself as well as on other people. And those techniques include tremendous emotional suppression that causes to a, to a degree that causes psychological trauma in and of itself you just suppress and deny your own emotional life and and your ability to actually experience life you know in all its good and bad and right and wrong is impacted by that and that's just one of about 20 different things that scientology is doing to you so getting her out of that was a truly heroic thing for her to do. She was not, the, the outcome of that was in no way set. And, mm. uh, and I was very impressed by what Katie did to arrange all that and, and do that. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, well, when you say escape, was it a, a real escape? Was it really like, she, what could have happened to her? Well, it had Tom known or found out about what was going on, he absolutely would have tried to do what we call in Scientology a, a departure deter, <laughs> you know, a, an attempt to stop her from leaving. I mean, in the mm. world of Scientology and the Sea Org, um, there have been numerous testimonials and, and stories told about people getting locked up in rooms, being put under watch, being put, um, you know, basically under lock and key while they are while they contemplated the wisdom of their choices and whether they should really be leaving Scientology or not they don't want you leaving right and this has happened enough times in enough circumstances that it's that it presents itself as a real problem in that world is you don't know what they're going to do if you try to leave and one of the defining characteristics or questions you can ask yourself when you're looking at a group as to whether it's a destructive cult or not is what happens when you try to leave? And if you try to leave and they go, hey, knock yourself out, you come back if you ever feel like it, no big deal. We're, we're happy to keep talking to you. Okay, that's not a cult. You, you, you know, if you can just walk out the door and it's no harm, no foul, then that does, that's not very culty. But the exact opposite is what happens in groups like Scientology. You try to leave, and they do anything and everything they can to keep you, to hold on to you, to force you to stay. Because they truly believe, they truly believe that this group, this relationship, this activity is the single best thing you could possibly be involved in. How could you possibly want to leave there must be something wrong with you that you're wanting to go. So stay and let's fix it. Mm. And, you know, could Tom Cruise pull that on her? Of course he could. Of course he could. They, you know, I've, I've, heard it, I've heard it said the worst kind of dictator or authoritarian is the type that thinks that they're doing good for you they, because they'll never stop. Exactly. Exactly. That's how we justify and rationalize so much abuse and trauma is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I had the, I mean, I, you know, I can, again, I can look at myself and present myself as a, as a model of this. I was involved in Scientology for decades. I actually believed I truly to the, to the core of my being, I believed that I was saving the world. And mm -hmm. therefore, because I believed that, Everything I did, whether it was good, bad, or sideways, I could rationalize as being the greatest good. Anything. If I have to keep you locked in a room to convince you how good Scientology is for you because you have slipped and you've gone off the rails and you've, you know, you've somehow done something or seen something or said something, you know, that that is that is thrown you off, I need to get you back on the on the straight and narrow. 
you know, the attitude is very similar. And my attitude would have been very similar to if I thought you, you know, I, I'm a former, you know, I don't know, drug addict. And I think you're slipping and going back on drugs. And I'm going to do everything I can to save you and prevent you from doing that. That's the attitude, right? You think you're the good guy. And it is, it does result in some of the worst abuses, unfortunately, when people approach things that way, when they're that convinced of their own rightness, that they can't think critically about what they're doing. Does Tom Cruise think he's the good guy, even when he thinks about the the horrible abuses that go on basically under his name, in his name? Oh yeah, Tom Cruise is absolutely convinced he's the good guy. I mean, his his that you know, and and, and the insight here is uh, his own words. He's he's expressed it himself in that video he did with the turtleneck sweater, right? That that uh, that when he got the award from Scientology back in two thousand four, they they leaked the video where he's talking about in very glowing terms himself and Scientology and how it is the only solution to all, all the problems that ail man. And, you know, at a roadside accident, a Scientologist is the only person who can really be effective and really do anything helpful. When it comes to mental health, he says, we are the authorities on, you know, on, on psychology, on, on, on mental health and therapy. Scientology is the authorities. The, the, the psychologists don't know what the hell they're talking about. He went on a roll about that with Matt Lauer. I mean, again, mm. this is the real Tom Cruise mm. coming out. This is what he really thinks. Yeah. He's had to tone all of that way down. He had to pull all that back because it was literally destroying his career because he was being such a fanatic about it on camera. He was being weird. Um, and no, I've got a comment from uh, Gnome, Gnome Sane saying, I love Michael Douglas and falling down at the end when he says, I'm the bad guy. I love that as well. I, you know, I'm yeah. the bad guy. And uh, I, I always think of Breaking Bad as well, why it was so brilliant, because he spends the whole series, the whole way through, he's saying, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for my family. And he says it. he's about to say it again. He says, I'm doing it. And his wife looks at him and, he's, and he goes, for me. And he realized that's why he did it all. And, and that's what we are. That's, I'm, anyway, I'm going to ask you um, one more question about Tom Cruise and then open it up uh, just for like 10 minutes or so to people. So if you've got questions for Chris, maybe even a question for me, but I don't know why you would, but you might do, um, start putting them in and I'll try and sort of keep track of them. But, uh, and, and, you know, as I say, please hit the like button, do all the, do all the stuff, please. We want you to do all the stuff. That, yeah, as, as uh, Operation Paperclip says, smash the like, subscribe. Um, <laughs> Do you see an? Do you see ever? And I think you you touched on this earlier. Do you ever ever see a moment where we open the newspaper and it's Tom Cruise has said, uh, "I'm leaving. I've left Scientology. What what was I doing?" <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. Um, and I was thinking about this a lot actually, and I wanted to make this point again and reiterate it because I think it's an important one. Tom Cruise has had nothing but success, really. Uh, professionally, I am personally, maybe not so much. I mean, three broken marriages isn't really successful, but he's, but it's very easy for him to reframe all of that as their fault, not his easy peasy, right? Especially his last wife who escapes from him because here's the, th here's the reason why it's easy for him to do that easier for, for him than it is for you and me, because Scientology tells him L Ron Hubbard gave a lecture in 1960 called why people don't like you and in that lecture the reason why people don't like you is because of all the bad things they've done to you mm. period end of story if they don't like you it's because of what they did to you mm. that's how l ron hubbard viewed the world and that's how tom cruise views the world he's a he's a strident supporter of l ron hubbard and his and his words and works and that's part of it and so it's easy for Tom Cruise to look at a, a string of broken marriages or failed projects and go, oh, well, it was other people's fault. Because look at all these successes. And there are a tremendous string of successes in his life. And he can attribute all of that to Scientology. And he does. So it only boosts him. And we have this thing in our minds, uh, which I love talking about, called confirmation bias 
where we remember all the things we, we you know all the facts that fit with our little story our little narrative we remember and we purposefully forget or or you know invalidate facts that get in the way of that narrative get yeah. in the way of our story well tom cruise is telling himself a story just like all of us do and his story is that he is the most successful actor in the world and scientology is part of the reason for that and scientology in, empowers him and enables him to be successful so why would he ever question any part of it yeah I, I think you're you, you're right. You um, when you talk about the confirmation bias, and I think he's particularly given to confirmation bias because there was something he said in that Matt Lauer interview about um, psych psychology. He said, um, "I think it was I, I always I always felt you know I didn't like psychology, and then I did the research, and now I know why I don't like psychology." And that's a typical example of confirmation bias. He went in already deciding for just a feeling, an instinct. He didn't like it, and then he found all the possible information that would, you know, say so that he, you know, to prove his point. Got a lot, a lot of questions that have come through, and I've had to sort of screenshot them because I don't really know a better way of <laughs> putting them together. Sure. But let. Uh, um, right. So Ray J says, question for Andrew: Do you do you special? Do you, I guess feel special now? You have sex bots spamming your channel. Um, I do not feel special about that, <laughs> and I didn't know about that. Uh, Frida, did Katie Holmes know what she was getting into? Oh no, 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 no! Nobody does when they get involved with Scientology. That's one of the that's one of the awful things about it is mm. you you do not know. You have no idea. When you get involved in Scientology, what you are getting involved in, and I and, and I have done. I mean, that's why I've produced hundreds of videos on the topic because it's it's a long, involved thing. Yeah. But to but but it, but it, we can very easily summarize it by saying that Scientology is a money making scam that uses religious cloaking. It uses this idea that it's a religion to get away with not only tax exemption and, and financial shenanigans, but all kinds of transporting, I guess we're saying in this episode. <laughs> yes. Issues, right. With people, um, yeah, yeah. you know, labor, um, the, the, the sexual violations. I mean, there is a number of things that go on in that group that are very unsavory, very abusive. And and I I was an eyewitness to it, so I I'm speaking from my experience. We've got too many so many questions, so we're gonna have to quick fire them a bit. Um, yeah. But let's have a look. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Gnome saying, where are all the overweight Sea Org members? They all seem so thin and good looking. Yeah, it's because we got work so goddamn hard, we could never accumulate any weight. <laughs> uh, I mean, there were a couple, you know, you'd see a couple overweight folks who got older and their bodies start, you know, the hormones change. Mm. But most Scientologists, most Sea Org members are uh, working their asses off. So they don't, they, you know, you see them gain weight after they leave. You'll uh. see overweight ex Sea Org members. You won't see too many overweight Sea Org members. Well, and Mike Rinder says in his book, you don't. At least when he was back in the, I guess it was the seventies, didn't get fed very much on the on Sea Org. No. So no rice and beans. Um, I mean, he would get penalized with weeks of rice and beans. That was the only thing you could eat. That's insane. Uh, uh, Jan Smith asks Chris, do they still have connections to the Golden Dawn? And if if so, you have to explain what the Golden Dawn is because I don't know oh, what that yeah. is. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an origin story connection. It's not a direct connection now. The or, the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, is an old occult practice and group hmm. and it's part of the origin story of l ron hubbard and scientology it's where he drew a lot of inspiration and words and techniques from is occult practices of the early you know late 19 uh, early 1900s late 1800s spiritualism occultism um madame blavatsky you can look up her work alistair crowley uh l ron hubbard called himself a very good friend of alistair crowley that they never met, but L. Ron Hubbard liked to name drop, and he followed mm. Crowley's work, and he was all about blood magic and sex magic, and that's what that's where Scientology comes from. But that doesn't mean that they're practicing blood magic in Scientology <laughs> right now. I got to be clear that it's that it's a different thing. It's more that they took the tradition and the and the intent of those older occult practices 
and he worked it into the framework of Scientology. So Scientologists themselves don't know their own origin story is really the kind of the point of talking about that. Jennifer Lynn asks, do you think a large majority of Scientologists know deep down that it's all BS, but they don't know what to do or how to leave or are scared to change, so they just keep going? I think that applies to some of them. Um, I think as time has gone on, most of those folks have woken up and gotten off the fence and have left because it's really a pretty tiny group at this point. But um, yes, I'm sure that there are still people who are in there because of that and feel that they can't leave because their wife, their mother, their father, their kids, whatever, are so deeply connected that they don't want to disconnect or leave or be shunned or or upset that apple cart at all, right? So they they just kind of put up with it and uh, do their best. Hmm. Did, uh, wait, I've asked that question. Um, ba, 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 Secret Watcher asks, there have been other successful actors in Scientology as big as Cruz, so why don't they get the same treatment from the church as Cruz does? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure there are any actors in the world as big as Cruz apart from Tom Hanks, but uh, oh, go no. on, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, that premise is flawed. There's ne- there are not other actors in Scientology anywhere near Tom Cruise's status. Um, the only one who's come close was John Travolta in the 70s and 80s. John Travolta yeah. was legit huge. And then he made this gigantic comeback with Pulp Fiction in the 90s. And now his career is tanked again. So, yeah. you know, John Travolta isn't really anything special now, but he was in the past. And he's he being the only other comparable person I can say John Travolta got the red carpet treatment too when he was that big and when he was, you know, glowing and 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 successful. Um, the only difference is that Tom is that is that David Miscavige never took his personal and interest, or was never bros with John Travolta, hmm. the same way he is with Tom Cruise. He he he. David Miscavige and Tom Cruise are bosom buddies. Thomas McNostrel asks, what do Scientologist weddings and funerals look like? Um, pretty much like weddings and funerals of any other group. They have their own vows and their own ceremonies written for Scientologists that, you know, use Scientology speak. But the, but the ritual itself of a wedding and a ceremony and walking down the aisle and all that is same, same. And a wedding and a funeral ceremony, a memorial service, same, same. Um, uh, uh, Ken asks are there Scientologists that are also Masons maybe um, but being a Freemason is kind of a secret thing so not something people talk about much I've met Freemasons outside of Scientology I never met any of them in Okay, Uh, Willow Lee is Shelley an example of leaving Scientology I I guess you were saying before Shelley is Shelley Miscavige I think right yeah, a leaving Scientology? No, she's still. Well, we in don't it. know. She's. Well, you wouldn't know, would you? I guess. <laughs> oh, we would. We would probably have some idea if she if she left. And uh, mm. I mean, I, I'm guessing, of course. I make some assumptions there, but there, there is no Scientologist whose name is as famous as Shelley Miscavige. <laughs> where's um, Hashtag where's Shelley? You know. <laughs> Kenyon Denning asks, is there any way to awaken and inoculate the cult mindset so people will be aware enough to step away or not join at all? And also, I, I would just add to that, I mean, what what you were saying, and this is what we were going to talk about, we're going to have to do another episode more just all about the cult mindset. We'll do that in the next few weeks if you're free and we could all do that. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, but, uh, you know, you were saying Tom Cruise has some of that and how could he, but you did step out of it and other people did. So it mm-hmm. is possible to do, right? Absolutely it is. What it requires, here's 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 how I've come up with trying to describe this. And I know this isn't this isn't awesome yet. I don't have this all fully worked out. But basically what needs to happen in order for a person to snap out of it is they need a one or a series of moral transgressions that, you know, just moral violations that they cannot deny. It doesn't have to be that something happens to you as a cult member. Let's say I'm a happy little Scientologist, and one day I see something happen that is just a, no, that's not okay, that's not right, and it's undeniable. Like I'm told I have to disconnect from my mom or something, and I love my mom, and there's no way I'm ever going to disconnect from my mom. That would be pushing too much, too fast, too far and I'm out. I no, that, that that can't be. And you start once you once something happens like that, 
then you can start questioning what's going on. You kind of wake up out of the fog of, you know, oh, it's all so wonderful. Um, it's that kind of thing, right? Something has to happen to you or has to happen to somebody you know or love or care about in order to start seeing what's really going on. You can produce that in somebody, but it takes an awful lot of work. It's not just a, a, you know, a regular walk in the park kind of conversation. You have to sit the person down. They have to trust you. You have to have a non-accusative, non-antagonistic conversation mm -hmm. or series of conversations. And it takes a while to get people around to that because they're very, 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 well, a good way of putting it is they're kind of fall, they, they kind of fell in love with the cult. Mm. And it's like, you know, what would it take to talk you out of, you know, being in love with your spouse? It would take <laughs> a lot, right? Yeah. What would it take to talk you out of being in love with your cult? Same thing. It would take a lot. So, it's really interesting because I, I just did an episode, um, which I've called the, the cult of one. I know I'm not the first person to say this, but about relationships when you've got a narcissistic uh, person or somebody with an antisocial personality disorder uh, it can be like a cult of one that the partner has you know subscribed to and then can't get out of uh, and there was the love bombing at the beginning there is so many similarities uh, so I find oh, that oh, fascinating same. as well absolutely mm. absolutely we've got we, we'll have to do that. like a couple oh go on sorry no I was just gonna say that was part of my study program in coercive control was looking at domestic violence and abusive wow. relationship situations the same way that we looked at cult situations because the control dynamics and the mechanisms that are used are the exact same. Wow. So that's it's it. not different at all. Yeah. That's what it is. We have to do maybe a couple more questions and then if we come back on in a couple of weeks, we'll talk more about co coercive control and stuff right. and you guys can ask more questions, I think, because i got to go and have dinner soon on my um, my. <laughs> My own cult of one will uh, eject me from my from my relationship. Uh, Con Shawnery asks, do you believe Ron Miscavige, who has been very outspoken about the practices within the Scientology organization and even pointed to criminal activities? Like, so do you believe what he said, Ron Miscavige? Absolutely, I do. I, in fact, I had him on my podcast a couple of times and I was on Ooh. his. Yeah, Ron Miscavige Sr. Now, he passed recently, about six or seven months oh. ago, I think maybe a year ago. Is that and, David's father? Yes, David Miscavige's yeah. father, uh, Ron Miscavige Sr. Uh, great guy, really, really super nice guy. And um, and he was in for many, many years, decades, and he escaped, uh, he and his wife did, and uh, he, had, he had great things to say about it. Oh, that's nice. Um, and yeah, I, I believe him too. Uh, Jennifer Roberts asks, how realistic is Leah Rem Remini's, I, I can never say her name, what is it again, Chris? Leah Remini. Leah Remini, you put it on the first syllable, Remini. Uh, Leah Remini's documentary, as someone else said, oh, what a funeral's wedding's like, you've answered that already, but how realistic is Leah Remini's documentary? It's, it's it, to the comma, accurate. I, I, I consulted on the second season of the show. It's, I oh. was in it twice. It's, it's a very accurate representation of Scientology. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, we can do a couple more questions because we've got 600, and, unless you're, you need to suddenly go, Chris. Uh, I, just because... Soon, but yeah let's go let's do a couple more and we can. maybe we can go to 20 past eight which is seven minutes time uh okay. gnome say and tell I, I don't know what a lot of these things mean so so if there is one that's like a okay so after being through three years of rpf i don't know what that is for phone shenanigans i don't know what that is are you averse to trying it now with your wife is that a troll question is that a real thing no it's not i mean it's a silly question but i was sent to uh the RPF, which is the Sea Org's prison system. It's a rehabilitation, quote-unquote, program. Okay, the Rehabilitation Project Force, the RPF. I spent three years and three months in it uh, before I graduated it. There was a series of steps you have to do to prove that you are loyal to the group and rehabilitated as a spiritual entity. And it took me three years to get through it. And the reason I was sent there is because I had phone sex with somebody who wasn't my wife. That's right. I remember that now. Yeah. And that happened. And I did that. And I'm not proud of it. But it happened. And this is not my current wife. This was my Sea Org wife. I, I was divorced when I left the Sea Org. I've since remarried. And I have not in any way engaged in any shenanigans on my current wife. I love her very much. But um, uh, I forgot what was the question now. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you, 
of engaging in phone sex now. I, I haven't done anything like that, just to be completely transparent. But I, I wouldn't have a problem with it with my wife <laughs> if we if we have the circumstances come up for that. I think it was a joke question, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> Sarah Sarah Banas asks, uh, and this is a good question: What happens, I guess, in your opinion, to Scientology when Miss Cavage or Cruz die? Yeah, tough question because it depends on the context. But um, I think that if uh, if there's a peaceful uh, passage of power possible, then that's what's going to happen. Somebody in Scientology will step up, just like David Miscavige did, and take over. There are people there who could do it uh, or who could at least try to do it or maybe a group of people who could step up. And I don't see that it's going to be a whole lot different from, you know, what happened after Joseph Smith died. Well, this other guy took over and... What happened after he died? Well, a group of people took over, and you see that in the JWs, you see that in the in the Mormon Church, and you'll see that in Scientology. I don't see any any reason why it would be different, unless something happened externally, like some kind of legal effort or other explosive, you know, kind of effort to uh, to to take the place down, uh, which would be good because they do commit a lot of crimes. Tim Greenglass asks, would a Scientologist like Tom Cruise or David Miscavige actually watch the South Park Xenu episode? For anyone who hasn't seen it, it's obviously the South Park episode where they really, really went at Scientology. Yeah, no, of course they wouldn't. Uh, Scientologists mm. are very, very inoculated against anything that is anti-Scientology, skeptical or critical of Scientology. They just won't watch it or have anything to do with it. They they feel anything from a mild annoyance to outright rage over such things. Hmm. Be because they feel that they are constantly being misrepresented in the media because Scientologists only see all the good parts or the parts that they think are good and they don't apply any critical thinking or skepticism to their views. And they're not willing to give themselves the benefit of the doubt about Scientology. They're all in. They have to be all in on it. And that's where they come from on it. And that's why they don't look at anything critical of it. Okay, last one. Uh, Captain Gargoyle asks, if L. Ron Hubbard, who it was the founder of Scientology, if he was still running Scientology, do you think you would still be a Scientologist? Yeah. Um, no, probably not. Um, because L. Ron Hubbard didn't run a ship that was any tighter, cleaner, or better than David Miscavige does. It was, I mean, David Miscavige learned all his tricks from Hubbard, you know, it wasn't any, and he just made things worse, but Hubbard was a, was a madman and, um, and very delusional and, and, and not in a good way. And I, I don't think that that's something I would have, uh, stayed committed to any longer than I did under Miscavige. Chris Shelton, you've been fantastic. Thank you for being on the edge. Um, I would just say to everyone, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm reluctant to end, but we've both got to go. But uh, we've got a lot of people watching this, which is great. Please uh, like this, whether you're watching on Chris's or mine, or go to both of them. If you want to help us out, go to both. There's, the video's up out on both of our accounts. So go to both of them and hit like, leave comments. Let us know if you want us to be doing this again. Maybe we can do it again. Maybe we'll do it every single minute of your life. Um, <laughs> make sure if you do one thing, if you're from mine, go to Chris's uh, channel and subscribe to him give him some love he's, he's fantastic I'm a huge fan um, and you know if you feel like it you're coming from Chris's or whatever or you're new to this channel come subscribe to mine as well we love that and uh, yeah that's all I can say Chris any any words to that effect any thoughts no, this is, I'll, I'll reiterate everything you just said and um, and say this was fun I enjoyed doing this and it was fun to set it up so we were both streaming on both channels I've never tried that before I hope you all like that let me know uh, uh, for folks on my subscriber base, you know, you want to see more of this kind of thing? And if so, what would you like to see? I'm always uh, open for new ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Me as well. Same thing there. I've set my one up to redirect to Sean Atwood's uh, premiere that he's got going on tomorrow. My friend Sean, obviously a lot of people came over from Sean to this one as well. Uh, so, you know, it will it will automatically redirect. Have a look at that. Hit, hit a like, send a comment to him. He loves it. And uh, much love to everyone. And thank you, Chris. Thank you.